So it's safe to say that the public perception of Gran Turismo 7 has changed a fair amount since it released back in March 2022. The game, once touted as the saviour of the racing game genre and a long needed return to form for the franchise, has managed to fall so flat on its face that it's quite incredible to think we were ever hyped for it to begin with. As a long term fan of the franchise, start with Gran Turismo 3 and having played the game for basically as long as I can even remember, you can imagine how I feel about this. With that said, there is still a fair amount to appreciate about Gran Turismo 7. The level of tuning and customization of certain the best in the series, the changeable weather and track condition simulation is incredible in its depth and detail, and the car models and overall visual presentation are simply second to none. And that's not even mentioning the driving itself. If you simply pick a car on a track and just drive, you'll be hard pressed to find a game that can do it better. There is a reason why I've sunk over 400 hours into this thing, but on the other side of that coin, it's obvious to see that only a tiny fraction of those hours have been in the past few months. On paper, GT7 had every reason to be an outstanding single player experience, but it's difficult to come away from it without an overriding sense of disappointment and wasted potential. To the casual observer, the reasons for this may seem obvious. Force-fed microtransactions and an in-game economy that incentivizes the grind to no end. And there's certainly some truth in that, but if you look beyond the internet commentators and outrage merchants and actually play the game, you begin to understand that it's not so simple. So, here I am. This will be the first in a line of videos I intend to make that breaks down every area in which GT7 has either completely failed or not live up to the expectations. Let's start with something obvious, building a car collection. Something that's been an integral part of the series from the very beginning, and even featured a fair amount in the promotional material leading up to the release of the game as well. I mean, they couldn't possibly mess this up. Whoa, hold your horses. First, we've got to understand why collecting the cars was such a big part of these games to begin with. I mean, it is a racing game after all, not fucking trading cards. Well, not yet anyway. So, when the first Gran Turismo came out on the original PlayStation back in 1997, it shipped with almost 180 cars, far in excess of any other races on the market at the time. And not only that, but these were fully licensed real-world cars, which could be bought from a dealership, including second-hand models, at a discounted price, then upgraded and fine-tuned perfection. There were tons of different races and events catering to each type of car, meaning having a diverse collection was almost inevitable, and given you would then win even more cars as you progressed, the ways in which you could build up a collection of them was pretty much endless. And this formula has been the same for basically every Gran Turismo game up until this point. Excluding sport, of course, we're not going to talk about that one today. On paper, that description sounds pretty similar to GT7, doesn't it? Well, why don't we take a look? The problems with the game in this respect start from pretty much the second you boot it up. Well, the music rally isn't great either, but that's not what I meant. So, the game starts by giving you the choice between three starter cars, the Honda Fit, the Toyota Aqua, and Bulbasaur. I mean, the Mazda Demio. So the choice of these three cars in particular is very obvious. They're all Japanese compact cars of very similar performance, and whilst I would prefer the old school Gran Turismo experience of giving you a bit of cash and just letting you loose to buy whatever you can afford, I can somewhat understand this decision. For example, back in Gran Turismo 4, it was very common to find a car for cheap in one of the used dealerships that was just far too good as a starter car. Think something like an R32 GTST or early Lancer Evo, and just completely destroy the early events. So this does make sense to some degree. What doesn't make sense though, is that immediately after choosing your starter car, your first objective is to get the other two. This is introduced through the menu books, which are essentially a series of tasks, most of which involve collecting three cars that are linked together in some way, the first of which being, of course, the Japanese compact cars. So after making your choice, the first thing you do is to make that choice completely meaningless. Some of you may remember how in Gran Turismo 6 they removed this element of choice completely, with every player being forced to start with a Honda Fit. To me, the way Gran Turismo 7 handles this is even more insulting. It gives you this illusion of choice, the idea that, oh no, this is the classic Gran Turismo experience of buying a cheap used car to start your collection and your journey within the game, when it's very clearly not the same thing. I mean, to use the analogy of a Pokemon game, which I've not so subtly been referencing, you may have noticed, Imagine that after choosing your starter, you then just have to catch the other two anyway. And then even worse is soon after that, you're pretty much not even allowed to use your starters if you want to progress in the story. 
so they disappear into the Pokedex, never to be seen or thought of again. I mean, that would be insane. It would be like, why? What is this? What even is game design? What's the point? And I understand that these are just the starter cars, and in reality it doesn't matter that much. I mean, no offence to fans of the Toyota Aqua, if any of you are out there. But the truth is that most people are just going to move on with the game and not really going to care. But for me, I always think back to when I started my first playthrough on Gran Turismo 3, almost two decades ago. After weighing up the options, I came to the choice of the first generation Mazda MX-5 in Mariner Blue and never looked back. And ever since then, I've always had that connection with the car because it was my choice and how I wanted to use the car going forward in the game, such as which events to use it in and which upgrades to buy, was entirely dictated by me. And that was GT3. That game only had like 10 starter cars to choose from, and only a handful of those were even viable. In Gran Turismo 2, for example, you could find that many starter cars available from a single dealership. Anyway, even now in GT7, I keep a bone stock example of it in my garage just for those memories alone. It's just sad that people starting off with this game, whether they be young kids or just players new to the franchise, will never have that same experience. The design of the game itself means it's simply not possible. And to me, the magic of Gran Turismo is those types of experiences, and that's what inspires people to collect so many cars and just enjoy them. Not being lectured by a JPEG of some random guy as to why you should care. I mean, does anyone actually give a shit about the fuel efficiency of a Honda Fit? Is this really the most compelling way you could think of to get people invested in these types of cars? I don't think so. So, if this idea of forced collection, if you will, was just confined to the start of the game, honestly, I wouldn't have too much of a problem with it. Being truthful, I didn't really notice it when I first played through the game. It was only when I thought back about it after all was said and done, and then played through the game for a second time that I realised this. The issue is that this is the single player experience of GT7. You are presented with a menu of three cars, you have three races, and you need to finish in the top three to win each car. The races themselves are not that exciting or challenging, for the most part. You then come back to the PNG of a cafe owner, and then you do it all over again. Bar the odd break to do something truly thrilling like washing your car. I mean, come on guys, there were only 39 of these in the game at launch. Did you really need to put in filler? And you have to wonder why they even bothered adding back something like the used car dealership, when the progression is so linear and the choice is basically irrelevant. They also changed how the stock of cars updates. No longer does it update based on in-game days, which progress when you do races or other events, thus giving you incentive to continue playing, but instead real-world days. A simple change, but one that makes it far less rewarding to play through the game, and you see far fewer cars, and therefore have far fewer options. Also, everybody who logs in on a given day will always see the same cars for sale as any other player. Why they had to homogenise even this aspect of the used car dealership is beyond me. Even still, imagine saving up for a new car that you really want, finally buying it, and then seeing it in one of the menu books 10 minutes later, thus giving you an event in which you can win it from very easily. You can of course finally sell cars, as of the November update, however, what you may not have noticed is that you can't do that until you finish the final menu book anyway. The game puts so many roadblocks in the way of having a unique experience that the message is painfully clear. Play the game how we want you to, not how you want to. I feel like, and I imagine that a lot of people felt this way, that the menu books were just like an extended tutorial, and at some point the training wheels would come off, and the game would open up much in the same way the older games were from the very beginning. Problem is, when you finally get to that point, the game just f***ing ends. Seriously, you get to race group through cars for the first time, and that's it. Nothing more to see here folks, we're done. Bear in mind, you don't even get to the point of collecting any group through cars in the actual menu books. You earn a couple of Ferraris, and that's as far as you get. You can get a few more cars through the license tests and missions, and to be fair, there are a few race cars and higher value cars among them, but still, this is just a drop in the ocean. I mean, look at it this way. Through the menu books, you collect 6-3 cars. Not a huge amount to start with, and when you consider that each of these are earned from just a single race, let's just say it's not the most in-depth single player you're going to find. Aside from the Group B collection, which it seems like they only put in the game to make the dirt tracks not entirely redundant in the single player, there are no collections featuring race cars, whether that's Group 4, Group 3, Group 2 or Group 1, just none of them. 
no higher end supercars or hypercars, not really any classic cars, no Vision GTs, and no non-grouped race cars, or just any other cars which don't fit into these categories. Now, some of you may look at that and say, oh, it's obvious, they're all high value vehicles. No way they're just gonna give them away so easily. It's supposed to force you towards spending real world money. Just one problem with that. If that was their goal, why would they shape the entire single player experience and all of the races and championships they're in almost entirely around the few cars that you do earn in the menu books and then leave the rest of them completely in the dark? You would think that to drive up the desirability of them, they would do almost the exact opposite of that. If that were the case, no. The real issue is that the core single player experience and of course the events and races within that only exist to serve that handful of cars from the menu books as opposed to the previous games, which would serve pretty much all of the cars. You know, go back to GT3 or GT4, you pick any car from those games, and you can find an event to use it in 99% of the time. The exception to this being the odd one or two cars, like the Nike One or the Benz Patent Motor Wagon, which, fair enough, there's really not a lot you could do with them anyway. I don't think anyone was crying out for a Motor Wagon one make championship after all. But still, the way these types of fringe cars were handled in the previous games was far better than what we have in GT7. The Motor Wagon, for example, is given out as a prize car for completing the European Classic Car League. That makes sense. And that's true of pretty much all of these types of cars in the older games. You would earn them naturally by just winning races and playing through the game. GT7 does not do this. No, GT7 has the Legend Cars dealership. Of all of the multi-million credit cars, for a couple that you can get from the driving missions and things like that, you have to buy them yourself. Playing the game is simply not good enough. And these are cars, mind you, most of which have next to no utility in the game whatsoever. Let's look at an example. The Alfa Romeo 8C 2900B Touring. When I saw this car originally in the trailers for the game, I thought, that's interesting, I wonder what that would be like to drive. Sure, it's not really going to be much use in the main single player, but still, it'd be cool to try it out in a couple of classic car events. It costs 20 million credits, and there is no other way to obtain it. And this is not an outlier. There are many cars like this, and they're all contained neatly in one place, in fact. In the case of the Alpha, I've just accepted the fact I'm probably never going to get it. Not unless there's suddenly a way of earning insane amounts of money quickly and consistently, or they start giving out prize cars again, instead of just f***ing roulette tickets. But that's a problem for another day. I simply can't justify spending that much money on a car which is in essence completely useless. And they know this is an issue, because they sold it in the previous games by giving them out as prize cards. They don't have to do that, they could just lower the prices to a level which is more acceptable, and actually fits with the in-game economy, rather than tying it to the real-world value, which for these types of cars have basically zero relevance to the desirability of them in the game. To be honest though, I think they got it right the first time. Earning cars which are relevant to the event or championship you win them from, and then scaling the performance and value of the price cars against the length and difficulty of the event makes so much sense. But clearly, too much sense for Gran Turismo 7. I hope that through the course of this video I've been able to accurately describe why I think Gran Turismo 7 is such a betrayal to the franchise when it comes to this core element, collecting cars. I haven't even mentioned that the way of levelling up in this game is tied directly to the value of the cars that you collect, and that's because it's completely irrelevant. They could have just unlocked all of this stuff from the beginning, and it wouldn't have made much of a difference. If anything, it might have made the game a little bit better. GT7 is not an outlier in this sense, because pretty much every other time the series has tried to implement a level system, it's just come across as completely arbitrary and meaningless. I mean, take Gran Turismo 5. That game locked cars and events behind these level barriers even if you'd earned the license needed for the event, and had enough money to buy the car. It just made no sense at all. GT7 doesn't take it that far, but it is still quite questionable, such as how it locks online play behind your car collection level, meaning you have to slog through a couple of hours of menu books before you can even race online. Why? Who the hell knows? Another point is that I think the power of Gran Turismo as a tool to educate people about cars, automotive history, and just get them really invested in it all often goes overlooked. But I, myself, am proof of this. 
Gran Turismo is the main influence that got me to love cars, motorsport, and car culture as a whole, and it did this in such a subtle way. As an example, you could exhaustively explain the nuances between different drivetrain configurations and the mechanical theory behind them, but if someone doesn't have that initial interest to begin with, they're just not going to care. As a child playing these games, I was firmly in this camp, and I'm sure any 4-5 to five year old wouldn't have the interest nor mental capacity to understand anyway. But the way the game presented these ideas was simple. They had events for each type of drivetrain, the FF Challenge, FR Challenge, 4 Wheel Drive Challenge, and MR Challenge, and through playing these, the different cars you would drive, and how they handled, you got this basic understanding of what that means, and how each of them is unique. It's the same reason why they would sometimes have two of the same license tests, but one done with a front-wheel drive car, and the other done with a rear-wheel drive car. It's passive teaching, and this was done for many different types of cars based on things like the engine, the body style, the era it was produced in, and the country it came from. Do you see how this is far more appealing than what GT7 does by just forcing these ideas down people's throats, leaving newer players bored and confused, and more experienced players unrewarded and frustrated? It's a simple theory that is used in real-world education, in terms of how teachers get their students to engage with the topic they're learning about. It is debatable whether Polyphony was actually trying to do this in the older games, I think primarily they were just trying to make a game which had variety and was fun to play, but the impact is still clear to see. It's then amazing to think about how GT7 flipped this around, despite the educational aspect being one of the key targets of the game. One of the most basic events, the MR Challenge, isn't even in the game at the time of writing. That's just absurd. Anyway, an important thing to consider about GT7 is that it's a live service, and a game that's always updating and expanding. Surely that's a reason to be optimistic for the future, right? Well, let me put it this way. It's been about 10 months since the game released, and not a single thing I've talked about in this video has been addressed in any meaningful way whatsoever. Take the most recent update. What did we get? A few cars, which was very nice. A few more races, which the game is still sorely lacking in, but these ones are just more of the same shit we already have and don't really expand the game. And extra menus. Oh boy, extra menus. If you thought the act of collecting cars was hollow and pointless in the main game, you haven't seen the extra menus. Check out how the game entices you to drop a few million on some Bugattis, not because you would want to drive them or there's a new event to actually use them in, but because you earn a roulette ticket which offers the chance of getting a fabled engine swap which in my case, was one that I already had. A lot of. So, to summarise, I just spent a large amount of money to buy a couple of cars I didn't really want, for the opportunity to get a prize that I do want, but because of the luck-based system of prize giving, I ended up with something completely useless to me, and now a few million credits out of pocket. If this isn't a perfect example of every criticism I have of how GT7 fails to promote the idea of car collecting, or even understand why people do it in the first place, then I don't know what is. Thank you so much if you've gotten to the end of this video, it uh, really does mean a lot to me. Uh, you can probably tell that I've had you know, these thoughts in my mind for quite a while now, so it does feel good to uh, get them all out in one place. I've been working on this video for about the past month, and uh, it's been quite a challenge with the script writing, you know, getting all the footage and, and of course editing. Um, these are all things that were completely new to me and I've just had to learn on the job really, so uh, that said, I'd really appreciate it if you uh, drop a like if you enjoyed, subscribe if you want to see more, because I do have a lot more to say about this game so that there will be more videos coming soon, and just any feedback please let me know in the comments whether that be about what I discussed in the video, or just the, I guess the production of the video itself, or just anything really, yeah let me know. Um, and before I go I just want to say that I do really love this series. Uh, GT7, despite its issues, is still a very special game to me. All Gran Turismo's are, really. I wouldn't have gone to this much effort to make this if I truly didn't care about the game, and uh, and everything I've said in this video is 100% genuine to, uh, to how I feel. So, yeah, uh, that's all for me, and uh, yeah, hope you guys have a good one. See ya.